The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome to another uh, uh, seminar from Carnegie Mellon Data Group. Today we're excited to have Simon Kadar. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of FeatureForm, the virtual feature store company. So here's, he's here to tell us all about what a feature store actually is and how to build one that makes it that, that can scale. So as always, if you have any questions for Simon as he's given this talk, please unmute yourself and fire away at any time. Would this be a conversation for him and not talking by himself for an hour? Um, and with that, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here with us. Of course. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to be talking um, about feature stores. Um, it's kind of one of those concepts that gets hyped up a lot, especially in ML ops and kind of ML infrastructure. But I think there's kind of a fundamental "what is this thing?" <laughs> question to be answered, and how do you build one? So I'm going to really dive into that. Um, I'm going to dive into the different types of feature stores and really try to define what a feature store is. Um, I'm going to keep it more technical, just for give an audience. And I'm specifically going to highlight a few technical challenges that we had to overcome and how we overcame them. Um, specifically, feature like the way FeatureForm is built, it looks more like an orchestrator. And the thing with orchestrators is it's not typically like there's one super hard problem to solve as much as, as it's kind of death by a thousand paper cuts. There's like many, many, many problems to solve. And how do you get all those things to work together and build an architecture that kind of um, scales to all the different possible use cases that people would expect to use uh, some sort of orchestrator. Um, and yeah, I, I want to keep this interactive. So I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. I'll leave spaces in between the sections and I would love to answer questions about anything. Um, I try to uh, keep it in depth enough to give everyone good information and context if they want to keep going. Um, but I also uh, decide to leave it just one step above how deep I can get, just so I can let you all choose where you want me to zoom in. Um, so I'll give a quick intro on myself. Um, I'm Simba, uh, founder and CEO here at FeatureForm. I, uh, this is my second company. I was at Google before. My background is in software engineering. I worked on distributed systems. Um, my last company, I built a recommender system that powered about 100 million monthly active users. And a lot of the ML infrastructure that we built there actually became the foundation of what is now FeatureForm. Um, so agenda today, um, we'll start with what is a feature store? Start with the basics. What are we, you know, what is this thing? Why is it useful? Why does it exist? It's kind of, uh, whenever building a data system, it's really, I think people get really caught up in, in the tactical details and sometimes you can forget about what's the problem we're solving here anyway. Um, three types of architectures. There's three different approaches that the kind of ecosystem has come to and how to solve this. I'm going to break all three of them down and specifically talk about the architecture we took and why we took it. I'm going to deep dive into four specific technical challenges. One is streaming and backfill. Two, materializations. Job state and orchestration, which is kind of more the architecture of what FeatureForm is. And finally, monitoring and concept drift. And I would be amiss if I didn't add just a small little section on LMs and RAG, um, given the general hype in the space, but I'll, I know there's a lot of talks on vector DBs that already happened and are going to happen. So I'll keep that part brief and really focus on the things that are unique to our system. Great. Well, as a feature story. So when I say feature, you can think of it not like a product feature, but rather like an input to a model or a signal. Some examples. You might have the user's favorite song in the last 30 days, the store's, a store's top selling item in the winter, average price of all items in the catalog. These are all examples of features. You can think of a model almost like a black box that takes inputs or signals and generates an output or a prediction. Now, a lot of what data scientists do in practice and data scientists are end users, um, they are oftentimes feature engineering which is the, the um, kind of constant iteration on, on signals to come up with better signals to build better models. And the way they do that is they work in their notebooks. It's usually kind of a mess. 
They work with lots of different infrastructure. Um, they create lots of data transformation, which eventually becomes these signals. These are common problems. I'm not going to dive too deep into these just because they're a little less technical, but I just like to throw these in. So these are common kind of workflow problems that we see. And I think it's just as building a system like this, I think it's really interesting to see a lot of companies got really caught up in the technical parts of how do we make this thing performant. And there's almost this higher level problem, a workflow problem, which is often overlooked. And I uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about what's the correct API, the correct workflow to really get the system to, to work seamlessly for a data scientist. Some other things which may, may or may not look familiar um, to you. Great. Um, so final kind of bit of context um, before I really start diving into um, more of the tech and the technical details is that I, it's actually, it's funny. Data scientists, I think there's sometimes a little bit of fighting to get them to agree that, hey, Maybe you shouldn't be deploying notebooks in the production, especially if you're a giant company and it, you know your whole recommender system depends on this notebook you put together. Um, I think for this audience, I think it'll be very clear that you know that's not how you should deploy things in the production. So there's typically this fence between production and um, call it like offline uh, iteration. And what happens in practice with a lot of companies is that they will actually go and take these notebooks and essentially rebuild them from scratch into what is the production workflow. And what happens to data scientists' perspective is they'll come up with all of these features and then there's this huge blocker of how do I actually get this thing into production? The problem of getting things into production is a few parts. Um, one is that when you are experimenting, it's common to use a sample. It's common to use really unscalable patterns. Just use pandas. Use want your laptop. Um, but when you actually go to move features into production, you start having to work with actual data systems. You start having to deal with streaming data. You start having to deal with batch data. You start having to deal with on-demand features, which are kind of like stored procedures. Um, and all this stuff fits together to build the signals at production time in a, play, in a way that is very low latency. And um, yeah, it's production grade, let's call it. Um, so things that are not problems, things that we have kind of, we don't solve. Um, one is we're not trying to build a better Redis. We're not trying to build a better Spark. Um, we don't really view that as the problem to be solved. We're not trying to make everything streaming. Stream processing is a specifically hard piece of this problem, which I'll get into. And then finally, I kind of view the name feature store as a misnomer. There's a whole category and every single cloud has a feature store. Um, well, when you think of feature store, if you use feature in the way I've defined it, you just think of it as, oh, cool, a place to store features. In practice, um, how a feature store ends up looking and working, um, or how we think of it rather, which I'll get into. We don't really think the problem that needs to be solved is a new type of database to store features. The problem that we see, the way we think of it and the way we solve it is much more, uh, looks much more like an orchestrator. It's taking your data infrastructure, your compute, whether it's Spark, your storage like S3, any other pieces you use, and applying an application layer above it, which provides a single source of truth of resources. So you can define these things, an easy way to collaborate for data scientists, monitoring and alerting and governance. We need the ability to build every feature, every signal I create, I need to be able to use in training and in inference. And that's a very hard problem, which I'll again, break down soon. And finally, just having a nice declarative API to work with us and some sort of dashboard to really be able to understand what's happening, do monitoring, et cetera. Um, I think uh, the, the name feature form, like when we built features form internally, what we really wanted was Terraform for features. 
And so the name feature form is literally a, a nod to Terraform. Like I wish I had Terraform for features. So a lot of what you'll see in the architecture choices that we make may or may not remind you of Terraform because in practice, like a lot of what we're doing is very similar. The key difference being that Terraform is bringing up infrastructure and we're bringing up essentially data pipelines. Cool. Any questions so far? No, it was more of the high level overview. I think we're good. Cool. There's three types of feature stores. So I'm going to talk about the three kinds and the three architectures that companies have come up with. One type of architecture um, is what I would call the literal feature store. Literal because it's literally where you store features. This is the kind that you, if you've ever used a feature store, you are most likely to be familiar with. Um, the most, probably the most widely used feature store that exists, which is actually changing pretty quickly, is a, a product called Feast, which is an open source. Um, AWS SageMaker has a feature store. Vertex has a feature store. Azure has its own feature store now. Uh, Databricks has a feature store. All the cloud providers more or less copied Feast because Feast at the time was one of the first feature stores and um, they viewed it as the most commonly used. It was the largest open source player. So they kind of just mimicked it and built their own cloud provider around it. The approach they took um, was to have the user build their own signals, iterate on them, and then finally store them in the feature store. The value here is that all the features are unified for training and inference. For inference, you need to have the most recent value of a feature with very low latency serving. For example, if you're building a recommender system for Spotify, you're making a music recommendation, you might want to know the top song you usually listen to in the last, I don't know, their favorite genre in the last 30 days. So you want to maintain an up-to-date cache of that value. And that's what's stored in the inference store. On the other side, um, there's the, the, the kind of the training bit, the offline store sometimes it's referred to as, which is where the training stuff lives. And what makes that hard is that you need to maintain a historical log of feature values because the feature values are constantly changing. But when you're training, you're kind of uh, rewinding time and going to different things that happen. So maybe, for example, you'll go through all of my Spotify history. You'll say, Simba, listen to this song from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And what were you know these X feature values at that point in time? So you actually have to rewind time, build the features that they would have appeared at that point, and then um, uh, zip those together with the label to, to train the model. What that looks like, um, again, you're database people. So the idea of a CDC will be very familiar to you. So in practice, what it looks like is you have a CDC and a materialized um, up-to-date version. And the materialized version is the inference store and the CDC kind of stream is offline store. With the CDC, you're much more focused on throughput. You're much more focused on uh, correctness. With the inference store, you're much more focused on latency. The problem here is iteration. This works really well if your features don't change. But in practice, data science and machine learning is a very iterative process. And in that, you are constantly changing your transformations. And because the features are being treated here as artifacts that come out of the transformation pipeline, as opposed to being tied together, it kind of creates this disjointed feeling between both sides. In practice, um, if you look at Uber, if you look at Airbnb, Airbnb has a product called Zipline. Uber has a product called uh, Michelangelo. Um, there's uh, multiple others, um, like Pinterest has Galaxy. Um, Facebook has parts of FP Learner. Almost every internal feature store that you see at a large company is actually going to look like what we would call a physical feature store. Um, some people also call this a feature platform, where you actually tie together the transformations and the storage. And what that, the benefit there is that it, um, as you're iterating on transformations, the transformation is deeply tied 
to the storage. So rather than iterating on like kind of, hey, I have this artifact but stored that I can really easily serve for training and inference, it's as I'm iterating that artifact is automatically being updated. It also solves other sets of problems, which again, streaming and other things, which I, I, I promise I'll get into momentarily. Um, but uh, I think the main um, takeaway is like a lot of these companies have solved this problem of building, allowing data scientists to define features in a way that works in production in a way that can be used in training by allowing them to work in this kind of new type of database system, which is typically actually backed by more generic providers like Spark um, and allowing them to work in their own framework and having the framework be smart enough to automatically um, fill the inference store and offline store. Now, the part that feature form did was what we call the virtual feature store architecture. And the virtual, what it comes from is when we would go um, to our users in the early days, especially, the idea of them actually rehousing their data onto a new platform that we owned was kind of an insurmountable um, thing for them. Because when you go to a company like, let's say, JP Morgan, and you tell them, hey, you have all of this data, you need to put all of it through our physical feature store. Um, it's going to be transformed and it's going to be stored there. And um, it, it's a hard sell. Um, it's a hard thing to convince a large company to do. What we realized is that actually, one, most of these companies have something that looks more like a data mesh in the sense that it's heterogeneous infrastructure that is spread across many different teams. And two, that the main problems to be solved are much more of an orchestration and this, a kind of an application layer problem, having a single uh, visor over this whole set of infrastructure, as opposed to um, actually building a better spark, which is what a lot of people set out to do. And so that's why we came to this approach of why don't we act more like an orchestrator and perform a lot of the kind of unique operations that exist for um, uh, for feature stores, but apply them across whatever infrastructure they have. Now, the con here is that we need to build infrastructure or interfaces rather that are generic enough to work. So if you use Kafka or if you use Pulsar, or if you use Spark or you use Snowflake or you use Postgres or all three, we need to be able to work in a unified way across that maintain a level of um, performance that they would expect, at least in the same magnitude of what they would expect without feature form. So we kind of have to act like a zero cost abstraction um, while performing all of this. And because we don't own the infrastructure, you can't really take full advantage of every single tweak you could do if you just were running on Kafka, Spark, whatever. Maybe you'll get into this, but like the... So if, if you're not hosting the database, the data itself, uh, what does an orchestrator look like? Is it like a, a little Docker file that they run on their network and it phones home and gets instructions on what to do? Or is it is it is it air gapped enough that it can just runs by itself? It's um, air gapped. So it runs in Kubernetes. We're Kubernetes native. And I'll, I'll get into like the architecture um, we've taken um, okay. in more depth um, in a few slides. This will be my last kind of overview slide of just the, the, let's call it the ecosystem before I start getting into some of the technical problems. But I just want to make sure you all kind of have context on what this thing is. When I start talking about problems that we solve, it's not kind of doesn't sound random. Um, but is there, that's a great question. I'm definitely going to dive into the architecture, but is there any other questions thus far from anyone? Cool. If you do, please feel free to um, interrupt and, and ask. Okay, let's talk about one of the, I would say, probably one of the most challenging problems that feature store companies face, which comes from streaming and backfill. So we talked about production features, and I'm really going to dive into the top left here, the streaming features. So streaming features have two things, uh, let's say a few aspects that make them unique. One, um, they are typically, they can be pre-processed. What that means is some features you would take, um, let's say a user's comment and you 
chop it up in some way. You remove the stop words or something. That would happen at inference time. So we would call that an on-demand feature. You wouldn't call that a streaming feature because it's actually happening at the time of the request. Streaming features are typically things like um, users' favorite song, or let's say the last five songs you should listen to. That would be a streaming feature because you'd have a stream of data and you'd be constantly generating the value of the feature. The value would be constantly changing and it would be changing fast enough that doing it in batch, like on an hourly cadence or a daily cadence um, would not work. It wouldn't really capture the, the value of that feature. Um, for things like last 30 days and those sorts of windows, though you could do those streaming and you can obviously argue that streaming is actually a superset of batch. Um, in practice, it's it's not and that the tools don't make it much, much harder to actually do streaming as opposed to batch. Let's talk about why. First, it's important to understand the idea of point in time correctness. The idea of point in time correctness works like this. So if I have a feature, which is the last five items a user clicked on, I don't want to at every single time, let's say that this is an input to my Spotify recommendation. Think of how many recommendations Spotify does just for you when you open the app. If they were to go and query your historical values and do kind of a query at that point in time, chances are it would be far too slow, especially if you're doing anything more um, like taking some sort of aggregate. Um, it would be really expensive, it would be very slow. And in practice, um, if it takes a long time for your recommended songs to pop up, um, it will have a very direct effect on stickiness, which will actually have a direct effect on revenue. So there is kind of a whole business case of making this really quickly. So in practice, all of this stuff um, gets pre-processed. So that's one piece is that you need to have the point in time of the feature at inference time needs to be now. So maintaining that. The other point in time correctness that's really important is historical correctness, which is that the way a model is trained, you have a set of labels. So let's say that uh, I'll use the same example where, um, or let's use a different example. Let's use an example, which is fraud. So I have a transaction, which is fraudulent. I'll name this as a label. And let's say the user is user A. So label Y is true. This transaction is fraudulent. I might want to know, let's say I have a feature X, which maybe is how many items or what's the average value of items that use, the user has bought in the past 30 days or last, you know, over the last five items, whatever. That feature is going to be constantly changing in value. But what I want to do is to be able to generate um, the feature as it would have appeared at that point in time. So again, it's the idea of building almost like a like a, a CDC stream, like getting all the changes and feature values at the point in time that they change and building a log of all those feature values over time so that I can zip them together with labels and build uh, rows, like training rows, as they would have appeared. Because from a training perspective, you want the model to almost be unaware if it's being trained or not being trained in the forward pass. So you want to be able to give it features as if um, they would have appeared in production to really do training correctly. Now, how people used to do this historically is they would actually build two separate pipelines, which is really, really error prone, as you can imagine, where they would build a whole pipeline and batch, let's say we're using Spark, um, and they would build these features. And then they would go hand out over the wall to a um, ML engineer who would take that batch job and essentially convert it into a streaming job. There's a lot of problems that come up with that. One, for example, is that sometimes those jobs might have, let's say, a seven-day aggregation window. But your stream, if you're using something like Kafka, you might not have a retention period that is that long. So you have to wait at least, even after rewriting the feature, you still have to wait n number of days before you actually have enough data to actually start outputting features. Two is you might come up with this idea, you might train your model on it, 
but your training set is kind of frozen in time and you have this like new values that are constantly being generated that may be changing, maintaining that correctness, doing that monitoring. There's kind of a set of problems that come into that, which I'll actually talk about later, how we solve that. Um, but I think in general, it's just this idea of what would be amazing and what kind of one of the promises of feature stores is unifying that streaming and batch um, pipeline so that as a data scientist, I can build a feature and I can know, or I can essentially that feature is deployable. Getting back to my old point of how do I deploy a feature? When I define my feature in this framework, it will work in batch and it will automatically kind of remain updated as new data comes in. Um, the final bit I should probably add is that in practice, you could be iterating constantly on features. Like you might come up with 10 to 15 different types of features just over a few weeks span. And you want in that time period to be able to test all those things. And no joke, the way Twitter, like a few years ago, released um, pretty much how they used to do it. And what they would actually do is they would come up with 15 features. They would deploy them or send them to another team to deploy. They would wait like, 60 days to receive back the training set so they could actually train their model. And that's kind of the, the, the iteration cycle. So they would just like keep trying things over and over again. And then 60 days later, they would get back that experiment that they tried 60 days ago, then they can finally test it. And as you can imagine, this has a huge effect on your ability to iterate. Um, especially if you find out that, Hey, this is a really good idea. And all these other things I've been spending time on for the last 60 days are now irrelevant because the first thing worked. So how do we solve this problem? Let's get into like the technical details. Um, so like most things in distributed systems, the solution is a log. And the reason why the solution is a log is a log has an interesting um, kind of effect to it that if you take a log, so a log, just so I define what a log is, a log is a, uh, 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 you can think of it almost like a stack where there's a first event. So everything kind of has a time period. You can append only, it's an append only um, operation on it. Everything historically is immutable. It's like a ledger is another way to think of it. Um, and the cool thing about a log is that you can never change historical values. What that means is, is you can freeze a log at a point in time. So if I cut it before those two events come in, everything before then will never change. If you only read from the top as events come in and you ignore the, the previous bits, it looks like a string. So it's almost like uh, it, it works like a batch data set and a stream at the same time, depending on how you look at it. And that's kind of the trick and it sounds simple, but again, like I'm gonna talk about how do you actually do this, um, which is a much harder problem. But the idea is more or less that when I generate a new feature, that especially one that's stateful, um, I will run a batch job. I'll freeze the log, batch process the whole thing. I will then stop my batch job, save the state, run the streaming job at the last event or as the last event that was coming in, and I will continue to update um, my inference cache and maintain a log of, or a, again, like a CDC of all the feature values that get created. As this image shows that was always here and was here every single time, um, there's kind of one possibility. So historically, when I built, I built a few feature stores in my career. And um, when I was able to own infrastructure, which is not a luxury I have a feature form because we're virtual, we actually use Pulsar. And the reason we use Pulsar is Pulsar has this neat um, characteristic that they um, separate out um, long-term storage from the message broker. So they, um, without getting, I guess, too deep into how Pulsar works, unless you all want me to, I'm happy to. Um, the you way it, it works is it kind of chops up uh, 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 streams as they come, they keeps, if you set infinite earth tension, it will build that log like I described. Um, and what it will do is because it knows that the historical values are immutable over time, it will kind of chop them off into a segment and it will actually offload 
that into S3 or GCS or HDFS or whatever you decide to back it up with. And what that means is from Flink's perspective, if I run a Flink job, it actually kind of looks like this perfect stream that has infinite retention. So when possible, which really the only, so I, my understanding is that Confluence Kafka, which is the, the kind of the paid um, kind of creator of Kafka, um, they have infinite retention now, um, but open source Kafka does not. And the reason that it does not, and the reason why it doesn't work is in theory, you could, right? You could set the parameter to be like so long that it essentially is infinite. Um, but in practice, the architecture of Kafka makes it such that the messages live on the same node as the broker. And because the um, data or the stream size just grows indefinitely, um, you would end up having to create a massive number of messages, even if you don't have, or a massive number of nodes, even if you don't actually have that much events going through the stream. So what you end up doing in practice, which I'll show, is that you kind of, reverse engineer what Pulsar does natively um, to make this work. Um, but that's the trick. The trick is more or less to treat a stream as a log, maintain infinite retention, uh, treat any uh, uh, transformation. You have to define your transformations in a way that they can be run both in batch and streaming. Um, and if you do that, then what you can do is you can freeze a log, run a batch job. So in Flink, what I'll do is I'll, I'll in um, Pulsar, I'll get the last message ID, um, that I see. And I will run a big job because in practice is way more historical data than there is data coming in. And I don't want this massive batch cluster running for um, when I'm just doing stream jobs or streaming events as they come in. So I'll create this large cluster, I'll process the frozen part of the log. And then um, uh, what I'll do is I'll do this handoff to streaming where in practice, while I was doing that batch job, um, new events will have come in that have not processed and will actually be in the log. So I'll maintain a message ID. I'll pass it to my streaming job. My stream will go back in time, find that event, that first purple event, and start its stream processing from there. So that's kind of the trick. There's this almost like really um, this dance that we have to um, coordinate across the batch and stream. Um, it's much more easy to see when we have to do it with Kafka because in, in here we can't pretend that Kafka is building an infinite log. Um, what we do here is as events go into Kafka, we will write them to S3 so that um, we have a historical um, log of, of events. We will also process all incoming events into Flink. It can also be Spark. I'm just using Flink and Spark in this example to, to create a differentiation between the streaming job and the batch job. This is the kind of the steady state. So this is the state when the job is already, like this is a feature that has already been created. All I have to do is keep it up to date as new events come in. Now, let's say as a data scientist, I'm like, hey, I have this idea for a new feature which is I want to know, I'm again, let's say we're Spotify. I want to know the average beats per minute of a song a user listened to. Well, now I have to run this big Spark job to go through all the events that the users, for every user, to generate this feature value and also generate the feature value at different points in time. It's not just like the current values, but what they would have been after every listen. Then I would do that handoff like we talked about, to coordinate to a streaming job, because if I do deploy this thing to production, I need to maintain that feature value in the print store. So that lots of the reason why the feature store problem exists and why it's so hard is actually because of how this kind of bimodal nature of training versus inference and this requirement of having historical feature values. This would all be resolved if, Theoretically, there was some way to build um, uh, if Spark natively could do um, uh, streaming batch unification, where I could build one job and run it across both uh, modalities, then I would be done. We wouldn't have to do this ourselves. 
And there's been many approaches to this. Like for example, Apache Beam has something called the splittable do function, which is an approach to doing this. In practice, even though this is like a known problem and it's been kind of an open problem for a long time, it's it remains unsolved. And the best approaches, like the really the approaches that most companies go with is actually just doing something that kind of looks like this. Just almost, I mean, I built this and even building this, it's kind of a hack, like it works. But it's just what would be really nice is if something like Spark or Flink did this natively, but they don't. Questions? Yeah, Simba, I have a quick question. This is uh, Jignesh Patel. Uh, how big does the feature store get when you see in the larger end of the deployments? Do they tend to be... Uh, they look a lot more like OLTP systems, small, relatively small amounts of data, lots and lots of updates, queries on version numbers, time, or do they tend to get much bigger? Um, they get huge. Um, this is actually maybe part of what makes it strange is if we go back to the architecture, it's like that inference store is an OLTP system, but the offline store is an OLAP system. But in practice, I need to make both of these things kind of, I have to maintain consistency across both of these systems and make it so that I can define one transformation that is both used in the offline context for training, which is an inherently kind of asynchronous, long running job. But I then need to be able to use that in a, a, a transactionally at in a production system. So it's both. And the off, everything I talked about with this kind of, um, batch streaming, like the batch job more or less is run in an OLAP style context. It's a massive data set where the streaming job, like in practice, it's still, I mean, it depends on the size of the company, but it's, it looks much more like a typical production grade transactional system. So in a big bank, let's say on something important like fraud, are we talking terabytes or gigabytes in the feature store? Um, Larger than terabytes. Larger than terabytes, got it. Because they're keeping a lot of versions going all the way back to be able to log and see what inferencing mechanism they might have used in the past because they can't age it till whatever is their policy, right? That's where the uh, the size of data goes up because you have to travel so much farther back in time. Got yeah, it. Yeah, so in practice, what companies at that scale will often do is they will sample things. So we still have to process it all, but we might not put all of it into storage or they might actually do a hard cutoff where we don't care about events. Like they will never make an, uh, there's a generic cutoff in the window size, which it will never be more. I'll never train on data that's older than two years old. And then you can ourselves, we can just never, we can just let that stuff. It's almost like a TTL. Um, so there are many techniques that exist. And even when they do process it all, the actual training step is very expensive, much more expensive oftentimes than the actual generating of the features. And so even if you generate two years worth of features, you might actually do some sort of smart sampling and data curation. So you only actually train on 5% of that data that is more like and most likely to have an effect on, um, on the uh, uh, model itself. Great, and one more question related to that, and you could defer it. What's the definition of feature? Because it could mean something as simple as a measure or a metric to the entire code pipeline that generated that. And if it's generated in Python, then it's like what what you know, it's like the hundred libraries that came with it. Like, how far does the definition of feature go? And I'm guessing different people carry it in different ways to it being just a value to actually being a reproducible code entity that connects to that value. It's a really, really great question. And I think that's actually the fundamental difference between how we think of the problem versus how other feature stores think of the problem. Other feature stores would think of the problem as an inherently, um, it's an artifact, it's the final row. Like the feature is the row of, of data. And you, for every feature, it would not just be one row, it would be kind of, again, like that CDC, like it would be every value of the feature historically. I don't view it that way. I don't think that is the correct way to view it. I think in practice, the better abstraction is to define it as like you were des describing, like actually a pipeline. And uh, there is this kind of 
open question on where does the pipeline start? You know, like, do we go all the way back to like the uh, kind of initial stream of data that's coming from the client? Or do we start with something that looks more like a data mart? Like, where do we live in that? And in practice, it really depends on the company. Some companies, like for example, LinkedIn, they have a whole data mart, kind of very clean, perfect um, um, data sets that the BI to teams, the analytics teams, the data analysts, they use. But the data scientists work on ML purposely don't use that. And they actually prefer to have the full control all the way back from the stream. So they can really make any feature they want because in practice, metrics analytics are a little bit simpler. For example, if you have a revenue metric, like you want there to be one revenue metric, you know, and you want it to be right, whatever right means. If you have 25 revenue metrics across the company, you would be, you know, as a CFO, you might be a little concerned for your job. <laughs> but um, if you are a data scientist doing ML, there may be many, many reasons to have 25 different versions of revenue. Because in practice with ML, it, features and signals, are, they're kind of a means to an end. They're not actually meant for human consumption. They're meant for model consumption. So if a feature with some weird cutoff, like, hey, I'm going to only take revenue of users who pay us more than $1,000 a year um, that are in, you know, the U.S. or Europe, but also India. And, you know, like you have this weird, like, cutoff at, to a human. It's like you would never, you'd look at the description of this table and you'd be like, why would anyone use this? But to a model, for some reason, it might be the correct signal to make the model perform very well. And one other thing you kind of touched on a bit, which um, I didn't really get into, but is a really, really, uh, is another really core problem space is, I talked to a bank who, I asked them how many features do you have in production? And they said tens of thousands. And it's a lot. <laughs> and I was like, okay, um, how many of those are like, are those all actively used? And their answer was, we have no idea, but we don't know what we can and cannot turn off. And we don't want to see what breaks. I mean, the real way they would do it if they had to, turn them off one by one and see who screams. Um, and I, there's some value here of obviously the lineage, but also the because we work on a higher level of abstraction, we can decide what gets created and when. We can decide what's worth caching and, and materializing and what's worth throwing away. Um, you know, in practice, um, all of these, we make it or we ask the user to make it. Technically, they can not do this if they don't want to. It's just we don't, you know, you get undefined behavior. But we want all the transformations to be more or less pure functions, which means that every everything from the raw data forward in feature form should be fully reproducible. Um, and if you think of it that way, there's a few things that opens up. One is that obviously we can turn off anything and put it back on at any time. Two, which is another really common thing is I mentioned a lot of times like features such as top thing user did in the last seven days. It's not uncommon to have a last seven days, last 30 days, last 90 days. And in these sorts of situations, we can actually be very smart about how um, we can process multiple features at once if we know that there's kind of just uh, n number of, of window sizes. Um, so all those things come into play. Um, and again, like we do a, a decent amount of this stuff where it's really obvious. If we own the infrastructure, we could really like, you know, go into overdrive on this because we would own everything. We would know everything, but we have to work with all of these vendors with very, very different needs, very different types of transformations. And it, there's less things we can take advantage of. Cool. Thank you. That was awesome. Course, yeah. Thanks for the great question. Any any other questions before I keep going? Cool. Um, I'm going to touch on two parts. I'm kind of went back on floor for whether I should join these or not, but I'm going to kind of end up joining them. I'm just going to talk about um the other side of this, which is everything I've talked about has been streaming. With streaming, you're kind of constantly um filling the online store, the inference store, as new data comes in from the stream, you're simultaneously maintaining, again, that log of historical feature values in the offline store. When you do batch, it's a little different. 
Because with that, you might be running on a schedule. And typically what's going to happen, or not typically, what is going to happen is you're going to first kind of in the OLAP style, build that table into the offline store. But then you're going to want to materialize into the online store. And that materialization problem is actually a very annoying problem that a lot of feature stores kind of struggle with. The reason they struggle with it is, especially if you don't own both, like an arcade case or a virtual feature store, we don't get to decide what offline store people use, what online store they use. Some offline stores are very easy to write to other online stores. Some aren't. For example, Snowflake Redis. So Snowflake is offline store, Redis is online store. Very, very common, probably second most common, the most common being Spark or Databricks of Redis uh, that we see. Um, there is no native way to materialize data or copy a table from Snowflake into Redis. So we have to um, fill that in. A lot of the feature form in practice, there's obviously the core orchestration problem. A lot of what we do is kind of have all of these little um just the glue. There's just all these things that add up and are really annoying. This is what I mean about like the, the problem of orchestration systems are is much less like one specific hard technical problem. I would say the most close thing we have to that is the streaming problem I just talked about. But a lot of what we solve is just these kind of like things that are missing that people just have to kind of hack together themselves. And you just end up with some insane set of scripts that people have to like kind of make this stuff work. What is, so what is that, do, so if you're going back, what is the step four you have and that, like, what does that materialize? Is it a bunch of upserts or are you just doing like copy into, like, what's, like, what does materialization look like? Yeah. I mean, the, um, the problem, the actual problem to solve is I have a, a table of all the feature values over a set of time. I want the most recent value of each of those features for each of those users or entities to be in the online store so that I can do a lookup and say, hey, what was Simba's you know, value of this feature or what is currently Simba's value for this feature? So when I do a recommendation, I kind of have this nice cache of pre-processed features I can use. So that's a problem we solve. How you actually solve it, um, different companies and products do it in different ways. Like the way Feast does it is they just do a very kind of dumb, just copy everything over, upsert style. Um, now, when you're when we do it, we actually take the diff because in a funny way, the most expensive operation is actually the copying of data over network um, in terms of time um, and actually the processing of the data in place in the offline store um, is not typically it's less. So in practice, what we end up doing is we actually maintain what was the last snapshot of the, so we build a snapshot. So we actually build a, a view in the offline store of what should be in the online store. Then the first time we just copy it over like more or less row, row for row. The second time we maintain the historical value, create a new value and we take a diff. And then we just copy the diff over. So we can do the minimal uh, change to get the online store into the same um, state at, or the new state that it should be in. Um, so okay. that's the approach that we take. And so the other that, approach... Hmm? Sorry, is that that diff, is that done like server side on the online store or you basically do that in your Kubernetes thing? We actually do it in like Snowflake or Databricks or whatever offline store we use. Okay. And then all we do in the KH job is we just do the copy. And it's an embarrassingly parallel problem because it's just, I need to run N operations on, you know, it could just be N inserts. So I can actually just break that up into um, a job and I can just copy those things over. And I think okay. using Kubernetes in this way is, is something that's unique to us, like being Kubernetes native and just really using Kubernetes, not just as this thing runs our servers, but actually as this operating system for distributed systems where we can like kind of spawn jobs and really just take full advantage of, of whatever infrastructure they give us, whether it's on-prem or it's, you know, in Google or both. Um, this is kind of a nice value prop we get. All right, thanks. And then getting into maybe the more broad, like what does feature form look like? Um, there's a lot of different components. There's online serving, there's offline serving, there's the infrastructure provider. We have these worker pods and worker jobs that get created. 
you have the coordinator, the metadata. Um, you know, there's other pieces. This is actually even out of date. Um, just looking at it, there's a few more pieces I've been added since. Um, but really, the core and maybe the core architecture, which again is kind of a let's call it a, a copy a bit of how Terraform does things, is we treat the metadata as the source of truth. When you define things in feature form, you are creating your desired state. Feature form saves that desired state. And it all the state lives in ETCD, or I guess the search is stateful, Prometheus is stateful, but in practice, like all the state that matters can be stored in ETCD. And if you back up ETCD, you kind of back up that feature form cluster. Um, and so, but how it works architecturally is we create this source of truth that is the metadata and the coordinator's job is just to take that source of truth, look at what actually exists in the world on the infrastructure providers and try to make these things be in sync. And if they can't, you know, if it fails or the job fails or whatever, then let the user know, set up monitoring, set up alerting. So I think just that approach, I think there's two common distributed systems approach. One is treat everything like, a, like usually the answer with a data system is like a log is usually the answer um, on almost everything like distributed systems. It's funny how often just using a log just comes up as a solution. Um, the other thing um, is immutability is your friend. Um, and so creating kind of this immutable, immutable in the sense of like, you can change it, but you kind of go from one immutable state to another. Um, makes these things much easier. It makes things inherently idempotent. There's a lot of value um, in using that. And you'll kind of see, I see, and I constantly use those two um, kind of techniques and tactics over and over again in the systems I build. Um, last thing I'll talk about is monitoring and concept drift. So the idea of monitoring and concept drift is, um, this idea where when I trained my feature, I might have had a distribution that looks like this blue distribution. But when I'm doing inference, I might have a distribution that looks very different. And so this concept is called feature drift. And um, actually maintaining this kind of view, and again, it's that mixture of like kind of the more analytical offline store, excuse me, stuff with the more production grade transactional stuff, combining those, maintaining transactionally, like here's the current distribution of things while also having this historical, usually on a much bigger data set, here was what we were trained on. Um, and then we have a set of, um, uh, I'm not gonna have time to go into all these, but we have different heuristics that we use on what we use when we use it, et cetera. Um, but I would say, this would be maybe the fourth really hard technical problem um, that people reach out to us to solve. And something that we have to solve ourselves is maintaining and building and coming up with the right heuristics. It's all heuristics. And then, in fact, for text data, we actually build our own um, models. So we use embeddings, we use other things to be able to actually figure out um, drift. But how do you use, because it's all heuristics in the end, right? Like, how do you figure out the right heuristics? And how do we do that in a way where someone can catch um, feature drift before it becomes a problem? There's actually a story from also from Twitter, again, a few many years ago now, probably like four years ago, where they missed revenue in a quarter. And they actually missed revenue in a quarter because one of their feature values was set wrong and it actually created like a 3% drop or something. I'm making up the numbers, but um, it was some relatively minimal drop in how the recommender system's quality was. But that actually was uh, something that made them miss their revenue target. And they had to go in their public earnings statement and be like, we miss our revenue targets because we had the wrong feature in our model, which just maybe I'll, I'll actually tie up on that, which is, um, you know, keeping track of what you're doing and why it matters moving up. And you'd be surprised at how often like there's almost a direct line of sight from like we hit our revenue targets because the feature store was good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pause. I, I have more stuff, but I know we're probably getting on time and then going a little bit over, but I'll pause there. If there's any last questions or anything else I can jump into. Yeah, maybe I can ask a question, but let me see if someone else has a hand on. Andy, if you want, if you have a question, 
No, I mean, go for it. And you, if you want to share like a final conclusion slide, go for it. Awesome. So uh, Simba, awesome talk. As you look at the broader infrastructure and people are trying to fold in many of these feature stores into the broader infrastructure offering that they have, you know, everyone's trying to offer a streaming platform plus uh, um, an OLAP platform and a data science platform. What's the case to be made for an independent virtual feature store? I'm sure you get asked this all the time. Yeah, great question. I think that there's two problems to be solved. And I've actually focused a lot of this talk on what I would call the processing problems, which is the part that engineers love to solve. Like this is like the stuff that, you know, why we chose to be engineers. Um, there's another set of problems, which I didn't talk about because you'd be bored to death if I did, which is how do we do governance? What's the right workflow? How do we get a team of data scientists to work together? What's the correct way to do versioning? There's this set of what I would call workflow problems. It's almost like API design versus like, uh, I would say every company that exists, it's actually kind of a quote from, from one of my uh, mentors who ran some very, very large database companies um, where he says that every data company solves one of two problems. They either solve a hard technical problem or they solve a workflow problem. An example of a hard technical problem would be like Snowflake. Like this Snowflake API is more or less an API that's existed for a long time, but they do it better, arguably, than everyone else. And that's why they're successful. The other set of problems where like, let's look at like Terraform and HashiCorp. Like it's not that, you know, AWS couldn't technically build HashiCorp where they do seem unable to build a strong Snowflake competitor. Um, the API problem is one, an extremely hard problem, and two, not a problem you can throw people at. Like you can get five people to build a better API than you can have a 100 person org. And the problem that we solve is actually fundamentally an API design problem and a workflow problem, much more so than a um, uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure problem. And because of that, we are just as, in fact, I would say we are more qualified to solve this problem than even a Databricks would be um, because it's all we think about. And two, um, we, it's very common that these types of problems are solved actually by open source vendors um, that have the standardized workflow and kind of build around that. And we're open source. I didn't mention that in the talk, but FeatureForm is an open source product. Got it. Thank you. Of course. I knew, <laughs> I do better than to make any sort of a, a definitive statement in a, a, a uh, a room full of uh, uh, database people. <laughs> uh, Ro has a student of mine. He's at Oracle. He's fine. Uh, yeah. Another question from the audience. Hello. Yes, go for it. Yeah. So you mentioned you have a kind of a. Uh, I understand that you try to have solving the data quality and then by providing a feature store also about providing kind of a. Uh, manageable out or layer on top of it to customers. And you mentioned the for the telephone for design state and also for the drift of it. And uh, but how do you uh, how was the kind of the story for the for the for the uh, how you know define the state? You mentioned about is a metadata layer and then you mentioned for desired state and where does this uh, what define and in your feature story? Yeah, I didn't get into this. I can do it real. Um... Like if I end this slideshow, is it going to screw up your stuff, Andy? So I can just show a quick... Uh... As, long as, you, as long as you don't stop sharing, it's fine. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll show some code um, just real quick. So how it works in practice is you're actually building like transformations. And um, in these transformations, you are defining um, uh, uh, like it, actually in this case, it looks like PySpark codes for batch, but all you're doing is you're decorating your Python transformations with feature form blocks. And so feature form is actually more or less, it's not trying to build a new transformation language. We try to minimize as much as we kind of do that. So you can continue to use the tools you love to use, but what we're doing is providing a framework above it. So we really um, have taken that approach. So the answer to the question, which I think I heard, which is how do you actually define these things is in Python. And you, uh, it's Terraform like, and that in the end, you you call Terraform apply, or feature form apply, and it will actually build these things. You can interact with them as data frames, and and um, yeah, it's a short. You can always look at again. It's open source product, so if you want to see more, um, you know, feel free to 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 check it out.
Thank you. We check it out. I did, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about <clears throat> how you speak about how you have these, like, like you're at a higher abstraction level than maybe Snowflake or something else. And then you have data ingestion coming in from there. And you have um, these transformations that are performed on them. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get an overall idea. Um, are these transformations performed each time you want to um, perform some sort of analysis? Or uh, how exactly is it, is, does it work here? Yeah. Um, so for streaming, they would be performed. There's kind of the batch section, which is performed once, which is kind of the backfill. Right. And then there's the stream, which just continues to be processed. In the batch situation, you're typically going to set up a schedule. For some jobs, depending on what the raw source is, they actually want you to just run the entire thing from scratch each time on the schedule. There is a way in the API to define kind of like an on update one where you could add, for example, with SQL, maybe you just add a where clause and where timestamp is greater than the timestamp of the last run. Um, so if it is easy to define your transformation to be incremental, then you would just run on the incremental new things as the schedule runs. And in situations where you can't, you just have, to, I mean, just in practice, you have to run all um, over again. This is actually kind of a thing that DBT gets a lot of backlash on as of recent, which is that they create, they can, if you use it poorly, create a huge snowflake um, bill because you're kind of just almost running everything over again in the most expensive way possible. It's super easy, but you pay for it somewhere else. What kind of performance objectives um, do people typically have for that kind of, uh, both kind of uh, ways you're doing it? Yeah, so we, so people ask us all the time, like what's the performance uh, feature form? And the answer is we aim to be a zero cost abstraction. So um, in practice, are we, like we're close, we try to be. Um, we definitely have a little bit of overhead, especially at serving time. But um, in practice, what we are what we want to do is provide a framework which in the end maps to something that is very similar to what you would be running yourself, if not more opt optimized in some cases, because we have all the context of what you plan to do in the end, because you're in the end it's training or inference. Um, but yeah, I mean, in practice, most of the heavy lifting is being offloaded anyway. Most all what you're doing is more the metadata and orchestration, which is in practice not a very um, uh, compute intensive problem. It's much more a state metadata intensive problem. Thank you very much. Of course, thanks. All right, uh, we're short on time. Do you want to share quickly your slides and show the conclusion slide, and then I'll splice that in to the video, like the, if you have if you have like contact info, or you're, I'm assuming you're hiring. Um, I am hiring. I didn't really add a, a final slide. Oh, um, and that's it. I'll, I, I can take care of that later. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, you have a you, guess you have a unique view of what people are infrastructure people are actually using, and you listed a bunch of these different uh, frameworks and everything. But in terms of like, you know, like Kafka versus Pulsar, what do you see more of? Way more Kafka. I think there was a time, and, and I, this pains me because I'm like a big Pulsar. Component. Yes. Um, I think Pulsar is a, an amazing system, but in practice, I think there was a window where Pulsar was gaining hype and, and speed. And, and the kind of question was, can Kafka catch up to Pulsar functionality? Because I do think that Pulsar was the better system versus can Pulsar actually justify enough teams making the jump? And I think that it's kind of been put to rest, in my opinion, and, and Kafka has come out um victorious and i think mm -hmm. that practice all the things that make pulsar such a great system are kind of being backfilled into kafka anyway so and, then, um, and what about flake versus spark what do you see more of um much more spark in general i think databricks has just done such a fantastic job of kind of expanding the footprint of spark i think flink lacks there are companies behind i assume actually some of them have probably spoken here before but there are many companies that I've kind of tried to take Flink to production. There used to be one, which is Viverica, which was acquired by Alibaba. Um, and now there's like Decodable and a few others. Um, they, the, con been... Confluent, the Confluent people just bought uh, the uh, the new one, the new Flink company. I forget what it's called though. They bought it last oh, month. Um, I didn't know that. But yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. it feels like the there's not been like a Confluent Databricks equivalent for um, Flink or yes. Pulsar really. There's always been startups, but I think because of that, it's hard to get that sort of uh, 
buy-in because it's such an expensive thing and for a big company to commit to. But I do see a lot of flank. So I will say there is a lot of flank. It's interesting that the ecosystem also in China versus in the US is quite different. And there's a lot more flank in China than um, there is in the US as a percentage. I'm not sure why, but it's just something I've noticed. Because Alibaba bought, bought date artisans. Well, that's yeah. probably definitely a part of it. But I, I wonder if it um, predates that, actually. I wonder if there's some other, other reasons to it. I said Confluent bought Emrock. That was the Flick company. They bought Got them it. back in Jan- January. Yeah, yeah. You know.